So living in Detroit, do you really believe that your cost of living has averaged going up a year for the last five years, one and a half percent? No, definitely not. Definitely right. not. <laughs> but, but, but that's what the government will have you think. Right. So now, now you've got all these wonderful people work their tails off, try to make ends meet, do everything they're supposed to do, go to work, work hard, pay their taxes, and every year their life gets tougher. Welcome to Rethinking the Dollar. Today I'm excited to have my guest, Mr. Ed Botowski. He's a managing partner at Chatwood Investments, and today he's sitting down with us to discuss our current state of our economy, as well as to give us an inside look into a unique consumer price index research he's done over at Chatwood Index. Mr. Botowski is an internationally recognized expert in investment wealth management, as well as personal financial industry, and he's been featured on several mainstream media outlets discussing his research throughout the United States. So, Ed, welcome to Rethinking the Dollar. Well, thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate you coming on and definitely looking forward to diving more into your calculations with the CPI there. But for, for those that may not be familiar with your work, can you give us a little bit of, a, of more of your background? Well, sure. I, I grew up in the investment management business at Morgan Stanley, and I, I ran the high net worth group in the Southwest. Uh, I then left there, went uh, over to Bank of America for a period of time, and then went off on my own and started the firm Chapwood Investments. And I during that time period, some of my work, people got to know because I put together an article in Sports Illustrated called How and Why Athletes Go Broke. And then ESPN called and wanted me to turn that into a documentary. So we turned it into a movie called Broke. And uh, so I'm really the, the I'm really the person behind the movie Broke. And so everything you see in that, uh, it's a 30 for 30 series, is stuff that I included, I put in there to really drive home the point as to why so many people, not just athletes, but in that movie it was athletes, but why so many people go broke. And I think that the first step in solving a problem is identifying the problem. Uh, many years ago, my mother uh, was sick and she was passing away. And I went home, I live in Dallas now, and she's in New York, or she was in New York. And I got home to surprise her because it was the last birthday I was gonna spend with her uh, because I knew she was gonna pass away. And when I got there, this is what happened. She wasn't there. And it shocked me because I knew she was very sick. And she walked in about three hours later after I was frantic trying to find her. Uh, there were no cell phones back then. I'll tell you how old I am. But uh, when, she, when she walked in the door, um, I said, where have you been? And she said, I was at work. And I thought, I'm, you were at work? I didn't even know she had a job. And her answer was this. She said, your father did not adjust my alimony for COLA. And I thought, what is cola? All I could think about at that time was that she drank something called Tab. Uh -huh. And she always said she didn't like Coca-Cola. And I thought, wow, you must be really sick because you're drinking cola now. <laughs> well, I had no idea what she meant. And the more I investigated this cost of living adjustment, I found out that the government, dating all the way back to 83, and this was in 1994, this occurred with my mother, had changed the way they calculated the cost of living adjustment, or as we know it, the CPI. Some people say they're different, but, but don't get caught up in that. They're not. They're the same thing. And adjustments are made on income based on the CPI. And the more you look at that, the more you realize what a disaster uh, we have in this country because a lot of people in the private sector, their increases in their salaries are tied to this number. So living in Detroit, do you really believe that your cost of living has averaged going up a year for the last five years, one and a half percent? No, definitely not. Definitely right. not. <laughs> but, but, but that's what the government will have you think. Right. So now, now you've got all these wonderful people work their tails off, try to make ends meet, do everything they're supposed to do, go to work, work hard, pay their taxes, and every year their life gets tougher. And, and, and the reason that's the case, and it also has something to do, go back to the unions for a moment, um, and why, why Detroit isn't what it used to be, was that we had so much, um, so many businesses whose cost of living increases were soaring, but their, but their salaries weren't. So people were like, I can't make ends meet here. So they would leave because you had higher taxes, you had higher insurance costs. And I investigated this, so I created the Chaplet Index. And the index tracks the top 500 items that we spend our after-tax dollars on. And, and I have a, a way of weighting those 
And the end result is that your cost of living increase in, in Detroit is somewhere around 10 to 12% a year. Wow. And what, what that means is that if you don't increase your salary by that, you're falling behind. And that's why I did the index. So, Ed, before we dive any further, uh, I typically start off by asking some what I consider RTD questions. And the first question would be, what comes to mind when Ed Batowski hears the words, rethinking the dollar? Well, the first things that come to my mind when I hear rethinking the dollar is, you know, what, what is the dollar's purpose in, in the world? Because we were the currency for trade. And now you continue to hear about the strengthening of the Chinese economy, although it's not that strong at this moment. And I keep thinking how many countries don't like us? How many people want to see the United States cease to exist? And there's a lot of them out there. And one of the great ways that they could destroy our country is by assaulting the dollar. And if we weren't using the dollar for trade, then it becomes a sideshow. It's not you know, the premier currency. And if that's the case, we're going to see a lot of people out there, a lot of countries going after and attacking the dollar and making our country uh, worth a lot less in the international stage than it is today. Right. Now, why do you think, you know, this subject matter of just, you know, what I consider monetary literacy or, or financial education uh, for, for citizens are, is, is very important at this particular time in history? Well, I don't think it's ever been more important. Um, you know, it's always important for people to understand how money works. When you combine that with the cost of living increase going up so much and their salaries and their transfer payments, meaning social security payments and other things not going up with what their real cost of living increase is and, and it isn't, when you combine that with the possibility of a weakening dollar, um, that's a problem because a lot of the items that we buy in this country come from outside the US. So if our dollar is worth less, then those items are gonna cost more. Um, you know, just about everything that we have, it could be a shirt, um, you know, where, where was that manufactured? If it was manufactured overseas and our dollar was worth less, then that shirt is going to cost more than it did previously. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of things that we uh, truly need to focus on and understand where do these products come from? Where are these services located? And if our dollar is weaker, then our dollar doesn't buy as much from outside the U.S. Right now, with that being the case, everyone you know outside is beginning to rethink the dollar as well. If you were to just, you know, give your opinion, of course, you know, where is it, where, what's the current state of our economy right now? What are you like? Where, where, where's the what? what what's, the, what's the current state of our economy? If you were asked to give the state of the economy address, for the most part, what would you yeah. say and how would you describe it? Oh, it's really easy. We're, we are in stagflation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called modern day stagflation. And if anybody looks it up and you see the word stagflation, you'll say, well, there's no way we could be in stagflation. So let me, let me help you. First thing, stagflation is a slow um, growth economy, okay? And our country, or the, the GDP in our country, hasn't really grown at all. Um, they have this ability to lower something called the GDP deflator. Every time they announce the number, the GDP deflator, which is the equivalent of the CPI, is made as low as possible. That inversely makes the, C the GDP higher. We should be growing at about 4 to 5% um, a quarter right now based on all the economics that are going on in the world, but we're not. We're actually growing at about zero to maybe 1%. And those numbers are very wonky. They're tough to come by. They're usually done through surveys um, and you know other data gathering. But roughly speaking, we have no growth. The other reason we have stagflation is we have runaway prices. Well, the government, if you look at the government numbers, they'll say the CPI is zero. Well, we know that's a bunch of you know what. So that's why I call it modern day stagflation, because your prices and your cost of living are going up about, you know, again, in Detroit, 11 to 12 percent. You might not like it, but it's the truth. Right. And if you want to challenge me on it, anybody can call me at any time. But they know it because the CPI doesn't include taxes, doesn't include insurance. And there's a lot of things it doesn't include. And they play a lot of games with all the numbers. So that's the second leg to stagflation. And the third leg to stagflation is high unemployment. Well, the unemployment rate is meaningless because it, they play lots of different games and a lot of people have dropped out of looking for work. If you included back in the people who are looking for work, in your, your uh, unemployment rate would be close to 11%. Mm -hmm. And you have really nothing wonderful going on. You have Everything is slow. The only area that's doing well is real estate, which is great. 
Um, they can borrow really low, and those are the people at the cocktail parties that have the big smiles on their faces. All right, <laughs> I mean, you can you can see a real estate guy today from a mile away because they're smiling and they're happy, and they think the world's a great place. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's great. Their their day will come too, right? Yeah. Um, but overall, the world economy is very slow, and the U.S. economy, you know, they say is the best um, economy. You know, what do they say? Like the, you know, the nicest house on a bad block. Right. Um, but the problem is much deeper than that. The United States is the pipe piper of the world economy. Mm -hmm. And as the U.S. goes, goes the rest of the world. It's not the way others see it. Well, the rest of the world's bad, so the U.S. is bad. The U.S. has to get its house in order, and then the rest of uh, the world will follow. Right. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's interview thus far. I want to direct your attention to the subscribe button. If you're enjoying it, subscribe for more great interviews to come, as well as go over to Facebook.com forward slash Rethink of the Dollar. And give me a like there. I share monetary news on a regular basis. Looking forward to bringing more interviews. Back to this conversation. So, Ed, with your with your calculations there and forming the Chapwood Index, you've mentioned you've listed about 500 or so items that people actually use. So, why do you think the government, you know, has not made the necessary correction or adjustments, or do you think it's deliberate in keeping those miscalculated numbers going? Why do you think they haven't, you know, came out with the real numbers? Well, I mean, they. The reason the government, and it absolutely does not um, have the right numbers, they do it on purpose because if the number was high, they would have to then increase the amount of money that they pay in social security payments and other entitlement payments based on what the real number is. So it benefits them to keep that number lower. And the negative unintended consequence is that all the people that follow that number as a reflection on what the real cost of living increase in their city and in the United States is, is being shortchanged by it. And because if the number was higher, the government would have to pay out more money, thus increasing the amount that we have in long-term debt. Mm -hmm. So up until 1983, they would measure 1,700 items for the CPI. And every month, they would measure the cost increase, and then you'd have a real number. Well, in 83, the number got to be somewhere close to 12%. So that means the government was got to pay out 12% increases. Well, that's absolutely crazy. So they changed it and the inflation rate, excuse me, or the CPI rate went from 12% down to 3%. Mm -hmm. And we all know that your cost of living doesn't, didn't go down that much. Mm -hmm. And they've been continuing to manipulate it. And in 94, there was something called the Boskin Commission. Uh, uh, it was a professor out of, it was a professor out of Stanford and he, um, also changed the way they calculated it again. So it's been manipulated all the time, and they're not about to change it. Matter of fact, they're actually trying to make it look lower again. Hmm. Wow. Now, you, prior to the, or, you know, coming on air, you mentioned how the, the difference between understanding the dollar and the CPI kind of are, are in two different ballparks. Now, let's, I want to talk about, about, about the purchasing power of the dollar itself. And so how does that CPI correlate with you know, the, the, the purchasing power of the dollar and what you can purchase in goods and services and things like that. Well, I mean, the dollar continues to buy less mm -hmm. all the time because these products cost more. I mean, it's, it's, it's really that simple and that basic. Mm -hmm. So our dollar, especially if you're buying items from outside the U.S., those costs are going up and the, the, the dollar stays exactly the same. So mm -hmm. it could be a bowl of cereal. It could be a water. I mean, not a bowl of cereal, excuse me, but it could be a bottle of water. You know, years ago, 50 cents for a bottle of water. Wow. Then it became a dollar. Yeah. And this continues, but a lot of it has to do with regulations and the cost of regulations and taxes. Mm -hmm. And people forget this one thing that this, this one thing that is crucial. When you have a tax that goes up in the state of Washington on a tollway, all right? And just think about in the state of Washington, apples. Well, that means it costs more money to get that apple because the, tr the, the toll went up. So they have to somehow pass that additional cost on to all the people that they sell to. Well, that means that the cost of an apple in Virginia is going to go up because somehow that company needs to recoup that money that occurred because of the tax on the tollway where their trucks drove. Mm -hmm. So tax anywhere is a tax on all of us on these products. And when you have increased regulation, in my job, we have a lot more regulation. We have a lot more costs we have to use to uh, or spend to keep up with those regulations. But as a result of that, 
we have less money in our pockets wow. because we have to spend that much more money. Well, in business, a lot of times they'll just push those costs down to the consumer. It's really easy if you know there's some company, they'll call it a clothing company, to increase the prices on their shirts 10 cents to recoup that cost. Well, after a while, it's 10 cents. The next month, it's 10 cents. Before you know it, that shirt costs a dollar more. Hmm. And that's, that's why we see these prices going higher is because of taxes and because of the cost to keep up with all of these regulations. So when people from the right start talking about, my goodness, we've got to change the taxes, we've got to change all these regulations. Well, you know what? Everybody out there who is uh, you know, maybe from 20 to 40 years of age needs to know this because that's why things are going up in price. That's why when you leave the grocery store, things you, you, know, you don't have as much in your, in your bag as you used to. Right, right. Now I know notice a lot of politicians always, you know, hint at, you know, saving the middle class, saving the middle class. So clearly, you know, if prices go up and the cost of living continues to increase, that will just for the most part diminish the middle class and either, you know, have you know, basically you have a lower or a higher class. Now, with the CPI numbers being the way they are, you know, do you can do you see the, the, the shrinkage of the middle class continue to increase or do you see it, you know, continue to just stay at an even pace like it has been for the last twenty, thirty years or so? Yeah, and, and I've always had an issue with how people say, you know, shrinking middle class because mm -hmm. just the facts itself, wherever it is, mm -hmm. middle is going to be 66% of the people no matter where you go, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but the question is, are we going to see the middle class go, the, the, their cost of living or their quality of life, mm -hmm. is that going to rise? Well, let's go back to one of the initial things I said. If your salary is tied to the CPI and your cost of living increase, um, is 8% or 10% and you're only getting a one and a half percent increase, your, your purchasing power declines six and a half percent. Well, here's the reason I brought that up. People in the middle class, their income is tied to the CPI. People who are quote the one percenters, mm -hmm. their increase in what they make is tied to their performance. Take an athlete. An athlete's going to make a lot more money if they perform well. Right. All right. Uh, somebody who does what I do, I work hard. I'm my own business person. And if I do well, I'll make more money. If I do poorly, I won't do as well. But somebody who works at a big company or works um, at a laborer's union mm -hmm. or something, um, you know, that is you know, maybe Target, the, the, the store, their increases are usually tied to the CPI. So every time they get a raise, if it's not – tied to their, their true cost of living increase, which it never is, their employer is really spitting in their face. Mm -hmm. And they should bring this up. And they should say, do you know that my cost of living increase in Detroit is 11% and you just gave me a raise of three and you mm -hmm. want me to swallow that? Right. And that's what people should be doing is they should go back and protest that and say, you know that the cost of living increase is far greater than this. So here I sit in the middle class and you're actually pushing me down towards the lower end versus helping me lift up to the higher end. Wow, wow. All right, so Ed, as we draw towards the end of our conversation today, you know, you've kind of, you know, laid out the problems of just the numbers being faulty and the, the those who depend upon, you know, going according, you know, making income according to those calculations will, for the most part, suffer. Now, solution-wise, what are some ways that people can begin taking action with this information? You've given us a good way of realizing the problems. Give us one or two solutions before we sign off. Well, it's, it's, it's very, very easy. If you're in a job where you get a salary and then somebody sits you down and evaluates you and helps you to, you know, and says, we're going to give you a 3% income uh, increase, I would quit that job. Or I would start finding another way to supplement that income through some sort of multi-level marketing, uh, direct sales. Because if, if you live your life where you get a 3%, five ten increase you are always going to find yourself falling further and further behind you're going to become old and mean and sarcastic you're going to hate people and you're going to think life has uh you know done you wrong mm -hmm. and you can take advantage of my words because i'll tell you right now i'm around a lot of hateful people mm -hmm. and most of them <laughs> is the result of not making enough money uh, to keep up with their quality of, and the standard of living that they want to. Right. <clears throat> so no matter what age you are, find a way to be a revenue producer, not overhead. Well, this concludes today's conversation with Ed Batowski, the creator of the Chapwood Index. 
Hope you found this conversation to be informative as well as educational. Scroll down below, leave us a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts on this interview. And if you thought it was informative, feel free to share it. And also subscribe for more RTD interviews. Looking forward to bringing you more. Until next time.